All right, welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I think we'll get started. Uh, so uh, welcome to the brave new world of uh, hybrid events. Uh, we have a good audience today in uh, Smith Hall at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, we're also joined online by um, a number of people who are watching a live stream. And I apologize for any hiccups uh, for those online. This is our first time doing a hybrid event. So we're gonna give it our best shot. Um, my name is Andrew Hedden. I'm the uh, Associate Director of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies at the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening as we celebrate the release of the new book, Menace to Empire, Anti-Colonial Solidarities and the Trans-Pacific Origins of the U.S. Security State, a uh, new book by Moon Ho Jung, a professor of history at the University of Washington. Uh, in addition to the Harry Bridges Center, uh, sponsors for this evening's event include the UW Department of History, the UW Department of American Ethnic Studies, and the Simpson Center for the Humanities. Uh, today's event will begin with a talk by Professor Jung, uh, providing an overview of his book. Uh, he'll be followed by Lin Nguyen, a professor of American Ethnic Studies at the UW, who has kindly prepared some comments and questions. After that, uh, we'll open the for questions from the audience. Uh, if you're joining us online, we will uh, accept question, written questions through the Q&A function in the Zoom webinar interface. Um, we'll then read questions aloud. Uh, finally, um, copies of the book um, are available for purchase after the event. Uh, I'll also post online ordering information in the Zoom webinar chat for those who are online. All right, without further ado, please join me now in welcoming uh, Professor Moon Ho Jang. All right, well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I, I really appreciate all the work that you put in to make this book launch possible. So thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you all for showing up today. Uh, it would have been really depressing if we had an in-person component and nobody showed up. So thank you for showing up and thank you to all of you joining virtually. Um, hold on one second. All right, um, and I also thank Lynn Wynn for agreeing to offer her comments on the book. I really look forward to what you have to say. Um, all right, so how do I begin to talk about a book that's 300 pages long? That took way too long to write. I don't know, but I do know I have to begin with some thanks. Uh, being at UW for the past 20 years, I think made the book possible. So I thank the Department of History, the Harry Bridges Center, the Royalty Research Fund, um, the Center for the Study of the Pacific Northwest, and the Simpson Center for the Humanities for providing me with the time and the resources to research and write. I thank many friends and colleagues who have shaped my thinking over the years. Um, just in case the U.S. security state is listening in today, uninvited, I won't name their names, but you know who you are, and you are definitely named in the acknowledgments. All right, and I would like to uh, thank all the UW students who have taken courses with me for reminding me every time I, I step in the classroom what is at stake. All right. Menace to Empire. Let me talk about the book a little bit. Uh, first, let me uh, lay out the stakes of the book by highlighting a few sentences. All right. The first couple, I think, captured the big framework, perhaps the biggest takeaway that I hope you get from the book. All right. So the two sentences are to point out the obvious a democracy rooted in empire and white supremacy is not democracy. That's American democracy. I was so happy when I wrote those sentences. Um, <laughs> way to go. All right. So in all my classes, I challenge students to try to articulate uh, their argument in a single sentence, right? Uh, the sentence that ties and explains everything together. So here's my one sentence for the book. Okay. So it's the argument for the book. Radicalized by their opposition to the U.S. empire, different peoples in and from Asia articulated and organized a revolutionary politics 
that I argue, racialized Asians as seditious threats to U.S. security and gave rise to what, what would become the U.S. national security state, the heart and soul of the U.S. empire ever since. <clears throat> now, let me read uh, some parts of the introduction to give you a sense of how, how I go about building that argument. All right, so Menace to Empire traces both the colonial violence and the anti-colonial rage percolating across the Pacific between the Philippine-American War and World War II. It's a history that can bring to light the ongoing racial and colonial order that has constituted the United States of America and the revolutionary dreams that its pretensions and machinations have tried to smother and kill. To tell that uh, history, I have to underscore some premises that will guide my interpretation. The first is the United States was and is an empire. White supremacy has fueled and justified that empire even as liberal claims to universal citizenship have obscured and erased that history of violence. The tensions and contradictions of race, nation, and empire generated revolutionary movements that exposed, confronted, and challenged the U.S. empire. In response, the U.S. state has sought to monitor, criminalize, and suppress those movements in part by racializing particular politics and distinct communities as seditious to rationalize violence on those ideas and on those communities. That is, the U.S. state emerged and expanded largely to secure empire within and beyond the territorial borders it has claimed. So it's that entangled history of colonial conquest, white supremacy, and anti-colonial struggle that the book strives to uncover and interpret. So what do I mean by empire? Well, the term empire, I think usually um, it conjures up images of a distant past, a relic of yesteryear, as implied by the lead definition in the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, that is anything considered as or likened to a realm or domain having an absolute ruler, such as heaven, hell, the oceans, etc. Now, in his influential treatise, Imperialism, originally published in 1917, V.I. Lenin radically renovated the concept for the 20th century, the concept of empire, arguing that imperialism represented the mon monopoly stage of capitalism dominated by finance capital and the territorial division of the whole world among the greatest capitalist powers. From a different vantage point, the economic motive behind imperial expansion likewise shaped the influential Wisconsin school that stressed U.S. diplomatic efforts to expand capitalist markets, an interpretive framework that emphasized the informal nature of the U.S. empire. So the United States was accordingly an empire, but seemingly an exceptional empire, supposedly in search of markets, not territorial conquest. The insistence on the informal, uh, presumably in opposition to formal empires, produced confusing geographies and chronologies uh, of the U.S. Empire, empire that cumulatively, if unintentionally naturalized, continental expansion, cleansed generations of geno genocidal violence, and obsessed over singular overseas moments like the Spanish-American War. In recent years, when the scale of imperial violence uh, or imperial claims and state violence has reached unprecedented heights, the term empire has made a comeback of sorts. Some right-wing scholars have continued to extol empire to glorify colonial misdeeds of the past and the present, 
unabashedly and non-ironically equating the US empire with democracy, capitalism, and freedom. More common, at least among US historians, have been efforts to disavow empire by suggesting its irrelevance to most periods of US history, more often than not by recycling that old notion of an informal empire. That is informal domination without territorial rule. Now, those subjected to, US, to the US empire's brutal violence could not afford the luxury of debating its existence. Arundhati Roy's work has been so crucial to thinking about an empire over the last 20 years. Uh, in the lead up to the US invasion of Iraq in 2003, Roy defined empire as, quote, this obscene, obscene accumulation of power, this greatly increased distance between those who make the decisions and those who have to suffer them. In a nutshell, that was and is empire. Now, beyond definitions, reckoning with empire, I suggest, is ultimately a historical project. Uh, it is a search for radical alternative paths. Uh, to commemorate the United States as a nation of immigrants, it's so habitual, it's so toxic, um, is to be complicit in its racial and imperial project, to discount indigenous peoples and black people's struggles against empire and slavery, and to justify the mass violence of the US <laughs> empire. So in turn, Roy urges us to use our radical imagination. So she proposed, quote, our strategy should not be not only to confront empire, but to lay siege to it, to deprive it of oxygen, to shame it, to mock it with our art, our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliance, our sheer relentlessness, and our ability to tell our own stories. Stories that are different from the ones we are being brainwashed to believe. So Menace to Empire is my humble attempt to tell a different story, a history that presents peoples in and from Asia as racialized and radicalized subjects of the US empire, not as immigrants aspiring to become Americans. That history was part of an ongoing process of claiming and contesting imperial sovereignty that has shaped the modern world. And you know, although I referred to the US empire over and over in the talk today and in the book, um, I don't mean to reify a political authority that it has claimed over and over. Absolute sovereignty has never existed. It has always been claimed and contested. So in that respect, I'm invoking an obsolete, obsolete use of empire, the term, uh, because it, it was an intransitive verb used as an intransitive verb until the 19th century. So an example would be the US military empired over us. Now to read the verb behind the noun is to recognize an empire's instability, incoherence, and constructiveness. But at the same time, we need to identify the United States for what it is and, and what it has always been, an empire. Because it's the recognition of that thing, a modified noun, so real, so violent, that can make us feel awakened, enraged, and politicized. So in studying how colonized subjects based in and moving to or through the Philippines, Hawaii, and the Pacific coast of North America engaged the US empire, I mean to illustrate how they pursued a politics, a world beyond empire. It's a story of how they mocked and shamed the US empire all the while suffering under its wrath. 
right, so what do I mean by the trans-Pacific origins of the U.S. security state? So by shifting our focus to the colonial origins of the U.S. national security state, uh, my book situates U.S. history within wider histories of race and empire, the forces that shaped racial capitalism across the world. So if we recognize the United States not, not as a multicultural nation that welcomes and somehow embraces diversity and equality and inclusion, but ultimately and fundamentally as an empire rooted in white supremacy from its founding to today, we can then begin to see how its laws have been fundamental to empire. So in the book, I don't present immigration restrictions as somehow an affront to uh, you know, American principles of uh, inclusion and democracy. Rather, I argue that immigration restrictions based on racial backgrounds and radical politics can be understood as an ongoing instrument of the US national security state, a means to silence and arrest unruly subjects from articulating and circulating revolutionary ideas and organizing revolutionary movements across the Pacific. Concentrating on the politics of revolution and empire in the first four decades of the 20th century, my book traces the, trans uh, the trans-Pacific formation of anti-colonial revolutionaries and seditious subjects who dare to challenge the U.S. empire. Now, the vilification of Asia and Asians as the yellow peril uh, has long been a staple of so-called Western civilization, uh, but it took on a distinctly revolutionary and counter-revolutionary character during and after the Philippine-American War. The Spanish-American War and its aftermath extended U.S. colonial claims across the vast Pacific and the Caribbean, uh, generating, generating new strains and, and fictions on what it meant to be incorporated and foreign uh, within the lands and spaces claimed by the U.S. empire. As peoples of the Philippines struggled against the U.S. empire, the critical pieces of the U.S. security state, already there, already in place, but nothing in scope to what it would become, uh, began to propagate and proliferate across the Pacific. So agencies focusing on intelligence and surveillance and laws criminalizing sedition and immigration attempted to make U.S. claims to sovereignty real, guarding against foes and threats within and without. And a barrage of laws on sedition, immigration, and naturalization targeting Asians and revolutionaries ensued, a convergence of racial prescriptions and political prohibitions epitomized and embodied by revolutionary Asians contesting the U.S. empire. So it's that overlapping uh, regulation of race and politics that eventually drove the U.S. state to obsess over the trans-Pacific movements of revolutionary peoples, anti-colonial subjects, a, a, a heterogeneous mix of humanity homogenized over time as seditious and pan-Asian. Especially after the Philippine American War, uh, growing numbers of peoples came face to face with the US state across the Pacific through its agents and agencies dispatched to secure empire under widening claims of national defense. The US state's expansion highlighted a, a particular historical moment when the idea of the nation state uh, as a fundamental means to political freedom came to be entrenched and embraced on a global scale. So with the imperial states and colonial subjects 
increasingly adopting the nation state form, empires became big nations and colonies became small nations or little nations as uh, Theodore Roosevelt put it in 1905, all abstractly equal, but patently unequal. And in our current moment, I think the preferred terms are wealthy nations and poor nations. But well, my question is, like, how the hell did those nations get wealthy in the first place? Through empire. So in that world of nations, the US state criminalized revolutionary ideas and revolutionary movements that challenged that emerging world order, which was really, really nothing more than empires in new, uh, in new clothes as seditious crimes, presumably against the sanctity and security of the nation. So laws restricting and prohibiting immigration and naturalization and facilitating deportation and repatriation inscribe the same logic. Those with seditious ideas engaging in seditious plots had to be kept out. And if they were already here, kicked out. That is laws on sedition and immigration naturalized the US empire by classifying those resisting empire as seditious, as criminal, and as alien. So in the first half of the 20th century, officials within the US military, US intelligence networks, and the US immigration system began targeting anti-colonial revolutionaries across the Pacific in particular because of their presumed affiliations with radical movements from Europe, anarchism and communism, but also uh, with Imperial Japan. So Japan represented uh, contradictory possibilities. It was a menace to white supremacy, but at the same time, it also represented an example of a rising empire. So if the former, uh, a menace to white supremacy, uh, could inspire visions of racial justice, that dual image of racial enemy and an imperial rival galvanized in trans-imperial campaigns to vilify Japan and anyone, anyone who might support an otherwise ally with this nefarious or presumably nefarious schemes to lead a pan-Asian struggle against white supremacy. So potential affiliation with Imperial Japan marked different peoples racially and politically as revolutionary and seditious. And deflecting and projecting radical movements against the US empire onto Imperial Japan in the process made the US empire seemingly defensible, not that it was, right? Now across the US empire from the Philippines to Hawaii to California and beyond, the US state melded the, U, uh, the yellow peril and the red scare to contain waves of seditious subjects who seemingly incited and warranted state violence and that was race at work. Even as liberal narratives of American history and Asian American history uh, promote diversity and equality as hallmarks of, uh, of, of the American nation, the overflowing archive of the US state betrays a history of white masculine domination that exposes, occludes, and advances its colonial mission. That is colonial authority is claimed unilateral sovereignty all the while aware of the limits of their claims. The archival records of a budding trans-Pacific security state documented in, de in detail US officials claims to state authority over peoples who unnervingly resisted that authority. So as those officials sought endlessly for security, and it's an, imp it's an impossible project, right? It's a never ending project. Um, 
they glimpse radical movements and interracial solidarities that could not produce greater insecurity. And that was, and I would argue that remains, the circular logic of national security, a nebulous and ridiculous conceit that signified more than anything else racial anxieties and imperial insecurities. To weed out those threats, generating anxiety and insecurity was the work of the US state, which has since become an unparalleled behemoth subjecting racialized and radicalized peoples around the world, uh, demonized and criminalized over the last century as anarchists, communists, gooks, terrorists, uh, to unrelenting violence, all in the name of freedom, and national security. That is the United States, the US empire, then and now. Now, let me conclude with how all of these broader forces uh, affected a single individual, Carlos Bulasan, the Filipino author and labor organizer that I write about in the very end of the book. When the FBI marked Bulasan as a target of investigation in 1950, the Seattle office was interested in his labor organizing and his leftist affiliations. But the FBI became really scared, really alarmed when they learned that, uh, that Bulasan had ties to communists in the Philippines. A Seattle agent informed uh, J. Edgar Hoover that Bulusan might have been working with Luis Taruk, whom he described as, quote, the leader of the Communist Party in the Philippine Islands. The office claimed to have information to suggest that a revolution was about to break out in the Philippines in 1951. And not only that, Bulusan had plans to dispatch Filipino labor leaders from Seattle to the Philippines to join that revolution. In the meantime, the FBI office in San Francisco poured over its files to find all previous references to Bulasan. And an agent in San Francisco discovered that the earliest reference to Bulasan uh, dated back to 1943 in a report on, quote, suspected members of the Sacta Lista, a Filipino labor organ organization then believed to be pro-Japanese. So an investigation into Bulosan's labor organizing in Seattle quickly became a matter of revolution and sedition across the Pacific. Now, it was no accident that the FBI's first reference to Bulosan emerged during World War II in an investigation into Sactalista supporters in the United States for their supposedly pro-Japanese views. In the Philippines, the U.S. colonial regime had monitored the Sactalistas in the 1930s for their reputed alliance with Japan and with communists. The movement that really captivated Bulosan's attention by the 1940s was the Hukbalahap movement, rebellion in the Philippines. On December 1st, 1949, Bulosan did indeed write a letter to Taruk, the leader of the Hook movement. Now, Bulasan told Taruk that he was working on a fictional account of Taruk's life and the peasant movement in the Philippines, and that he hoped to make the novel into a Hollywood film once, quote, the sudden resurgence of fascist activities here die down. Bulasan knew that the US government was keeping tabs on him, but he longed for a different time, a different place. He wrote to Taruk, quote, I can't leave the United States now because I will never be able to come back if I do. I think you know that the reasons why I will be there someday soon to work with you. I am playing with time. And he concluded that letter by writing, I'm a very small man only five feet and two inches, and I weigh not even a hundred pounds. But if there is anything, anything I can do for you and your movement, 
If it is only the use of my name, please feel free to do so. I am not afraid of the fascist bastards at home. Over Bulosan's lifetime, U.S. colonialism in the Philippines had given birth to a vast security regime, uh, the roots of a national security state fixated on suppressing sedition and revolution. And on the other side of the Pacific, in Seattle, Bulosan came face to face with that vast security state. In June 1954, after another long stay at a hospital, uh, Bulosan requested an interview with the FBI to try to clear his name. So in a parked car in Seattle, uh, Bulosan talked with several FBI agents about his personal history. He said that he had become uh, interested in the Hook movement in the Philippines during World War II, quote, because it represented a movement on behalf of the people instead of the rich landowners. And he denied membership in the Communist Party. When asked by FBI agents how he could identify or how he could deny following the Communist Party line when all of his writings always seem to follow that line, according to FBI agents, Bulasan reportedly shrugged his shoulders and displayed no interest in answering that or any specific questions concerning communism. Three months later, J. Edgar Hoover forwarded Bulosan's, fi Bulosan's file to the Department of Justice for possible deportation. And Bulosan would die in Seattle two years later in 1956. That Bulosan died so young was tragic, but let me uh, end on a hopeful note. One of the last items in his FBI file, it's the very last item actually, was dated November 1959, okay, three years after his death. A confidential informant told the FBI that Filipino labor leaders who had traveled to the United States the previous summer on U.S. government funds, no less, okay, were returning to the Philippines radicalized. After visits to the United States, the informant stated, quote, certain Philippine le labor leaders changed their way of thinking and become anti-American, unquote. The informant couldn't really provide that many specifics, but he identified Bulosan specifically as one such person in contact with these converted left-wing labor leaders. So from his grave in Seattle, Bulosan was apparently radicalizing Filipino labor leaders into seditious subjects. But here's the thing, there was nothing that the FBI could do with that report except to place it in Bulosan's file. And to me, that was a fitting coda, a metaphor for the US empire the U.S. state's claims to security and sovereignty were always greater than its capacity to kill revolutionary struggles for freedom and democracy. And that should give us cause for alarm and hope. Thank you. Right. Nervous, I haven't been around this many people. My classes are kind of small this quarter. Okay, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity to engage with uh, Moon Ho Jung's impressive book, pithily summed up as an historical examination of the relationship between anti Asian racism and anti radicalism. Uh, Menace to Empire is a vast and impressive work, 300 pages. Thank you, Moon. Um, <laughs> spanning nearly four decades to trace the development of the US national security state and the expansion and justification of racial violence through an archive of challenges to US empire by its racial subjects from the Philippines to Hawaii, South Asia and beyond. 
in telling the other stories uh, of empire and decentering the United States and unequivocally leading with its white supremacist and imperial aims, the book contributes to a trans-Pacific history of Asian movement, driven not by the ideologies of wealth and freedom that circulate so uncritically in discussions of immigrants and immigration, but by the effects of colonialism's destructive reach. The significance of this contribution cannot be understated as it allows us to see how policy changes and attitudes towards immigration have always been shaped by concerns over race and radicalism. The radicals detailed in this work, um, including Isabella de los Reyes of the Philippines, Hardial of India and others provide ample examples of the cross border and international movements of those menaces to empire in evading and avoiding the imperial reach of surveillance and shattering the myth of one-way migration driven by so-called American dreams. So I personally drew inspiration from the passages that quoted responses to US control. I'm gonna read a few of them to you. All right, so um, from the uh, Philippine newspaper, El Renacimiento, the question, how have the Indians come out with the Yankees? To quiet them, the whites called on the troops. It is not certain, but that the very noble of Lincoln was the one who said that it was a virtuous action, a worthy action to shoot all Indians upon sight, right? And then in um, Gadar, the uh, newspaper uh, that Dayal began publishing, the revolutionary newspaper, um, in an article on a British official in India who commented openly that he did not like black and yellow men, Gadar offered a caustic rejoinder. Our thought with regards to you is the same. You do not like us and we do not like you. Therefore, it would be proper for you to go a distance from before our eyes. Take your white carcass to your cold and barren country and leave our land for us. And one more from uh, Dayal as he's uh, being interrogated by an immigration official. In his interview with an immigration inspector, Dayal refused to renounce or apologize for his political beliefs and activities. Quote, as a general rule, I believe that tyrannical governments should be overthrown by mass uprisings. All right. So I, I, I truly appreciated and drew inspiration from these passages and kind of draw upon them as I'm thinking about this political moment, right? Um, so each chapter is threaded through with discussions of the specter of another empire's insecurities, whether they were viewed as enemies or allies. In the case of the Philippines and in Hawaii, the labor movement in Hawaii, the Japanese empire loomed close. This served to discredit the justifications of their own independent organizing in the Philippines and in Hawaii. In South Asian organizing in the United States against the British empire, fears over the integrity of the British Empire um, were constantly evoked in surveilling these radicals. I particularly appreciated the book's emphasis on the production of radicalism and Asian racialization or anti-Asian sentiment through their construction as alien to the United States, externalizing and disavowing these as the effects of US imperial and capitalist violence. Both were made so foreign and threatening as to justify the formation of an international policing force to preempt, quell, and contain any questioning of the legitimacy of the state. The perpetual fixation upon race and racialization in labor reveals how the national security state was built on what Jung calls imperial insecurities. The expansive imperial network of surveillance was simultaneously turned inward to domestic racial populations as in Hawaii. As Jung notes, it was through that process of identifying and repressing racialized and radicalized threats to the US national security, an integral element in the modern nation states always unfinished project of defending against foreign aggression and encroachment that transformed claims of imperial sovereignty into acts of national defense. His examples demonstrate how racialization functioned as a multi-pronged project of scapegoating, distraction, and vilification, deeply rooted in a desire to fix and contain. And it, it is an effect of the instability and anxiety of white supremacy. 
Mammoth Empire challenges the image of the US as a stable empire, revealing the project itself as one in need of constant assertion and reassertion and fortification against enemy others. Radically inclined scholars of history and ethnic studies have insisted on firmly situating the US as a white supremacist empire and menace to empire offers us this grounding in the form of countless examples of anti-imperial organizing and the crushing though never absolute response by the security states uh, attempts to secure its precarious holds over land, labor and capital. This book is so important for these times as the public continues to try to make sense of anti-Asian racism although maybe they don't care anymore, it's been a couple of years. <laughs> uh, something that uh, Jung and other scholars continue to insist is not new, it's not un-American, but it is in fact intrinsically American. The lessons of this book speak so clearly to this moment uh, in the ongoing destruction of the pandemic. Um, what little protections we have had by way of the social safety net, by way of any sort of labor protections or labor laws, um, in the anti-Asian violence surrounding that and exacerbated by the expansion of immigration laws, bills and policing, the expansion of a security state. In the surveillance of the radical intellectual described, I considered the attacks on critical race theory that are happening in this contemporary moment. As I read of how Das's writing and transcribed lectures were used as evidence against South Asian intellectuals Thinking about, in light of the potential overthrow of Roe v. Wade and, and the, the unrest that's um, resulted from that, what this book offers us is a reminder that the US state has always been a source of violence and thus turning to the state cannot be our only recourse. So finally, I wanna close by, by reading a, a quote from the end of the book. Um, as we think about how we're responding to this contemporary moment, um, what it offers us. Tracing the Trans-Pacific origins of the US national security state uncovers a history of colonial claims and anti-colonial struggles within which the multicultural project of insisting on the Americanness of Asians can be understood as the empire's last latest iteration of collaborative colonialism. An immense challenge before us is to reckon with history, white supremacy and empire in terms that refuse to naturalize nations, nation states and citizenship. Thank you. So I don't know how you wanna do this. I have one question because it's already uh, almost 4.50 and so I wanna leave space for other questions. So maybe I'll ask my one question and then sit down. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned this uh, in your in your um, opening comments, and I think that a really important distinction that you make in this book is to not frame this history in term in terms of a, a discourse of immigration. And I think uh, other scholars have done this. Uh, Simeon Mann's essay a couple of years ago did this as well. Um, can you talk about the significance of this in light of contemporary discussions of Asian racialization and how important this framing of Asians um, outside of the discourse of immigration makes visible how uh, labor, racial capitalism, and colonialism play an important but erased part uh, in that narrative. All right, thank you, Lynn, for those comments. Uh, let me riff a little bit on the earlier part of your comments first, and then I'll get back to the question of immigration. Um, you know, I've been giving a lot of talks recently, and one quote that I keep coming back to is Martin Luther's Martin Luther King's speech uh, from April 4th, 1967, uh, exactly one year before he was assassinated to the hour, not just to the day, um, when he called the U.S. government the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, right? And he would be vilified for delivering that speech. I would say the U.S. state is still the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. And I would say that the U.S. government look, has been the greatest force in history to commit anti-Asian violence, right? 
by killing millions of people from the Philippine American War to World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War. So as we grapple with the, the recent surge in anti-Asian violence, I think that is the context in which we should be thinking about that, right? So why is it that people feel so justified in spewing anti-Asian hatred, committing acts of anti-Asian violence? Um, well, I think it has a lot to do with the US state, right? And, and it's, um, it's killing of millions of Asians. Um, you know, I, I consider myself uh, as part of Asian American studies, I engage in Asian American studies, but so much of it I find so liberal, so nationalist, it's so dispiriting, discouraging, and enraging, right? So even just the term immigration, I find to be so limiting, right? So it, it is, and I said this in my comments, it is so habitual, so, and I think it's really, really toxic, right? To refer to the United States as the nation of immigrants, right? So if you uh, uh, narrate Asian American history, most textbooks, you know, would begin with the Chinese during the gold rush, they immigrate to the United States to live out, you know, to become wealthy, to live out their American dream right? It's such a ridiculous framing, right? Um, but then it's reproduced over and over, and it's so frustrating. Um, now, by shifting our frame to empire, I think that just can change everything, right? So I tell my students, you know, once you begin to see empire, you can't unsee it, right? So it's everywhere. So, you know, I've got a chapter on Hawaii and the 1920 labor strike. And I think we need to be thinking about empire and migrant labor in Hawaii, right? Not at the expense of native Hawaiians or the US colonial project in, in Hawaii, but to think through how all of those are interrelated processes at work, right? And, and how Asian workers contested the US empire, but at the same time also helped to advance it, right? So I think we need to be thinking through those nuances and contradictions rather than simply talking about the contributions that Asians have made, you know, Asian Americans have made in the making of America and so forth, which is, and, you know, I, I, that's such a ludicrous project, right? To, to, I mean, the big question for Asian Americans to be very blunt, right? And to Asian Americanists would be, why in the world would we ever want to join and advance this racial and colonial order called the United States of America? Why? Does anybody want to answer that question? <laughs> Are there any liberals out there that would not? Uh, sure. Yeah. I have to turn the microphone so that our online audience can hear. Test, test. Okay. So this is working. So if there's a question for Professor Jung from the audience, I will bring the microphone to you. And if you could just speak into the microphone so that everyone can hear. Um, hello. I really enjoyed your book. Um, you detail at length how the U.S. security state creates these biopolitical mechanisms of racialization. Um, that are, of course, like new and novel, and at the same time treats race as like a fait accompli, like something that's already just like done and naturalized. Um, could you comment on the through lines by which that contradiction continues to stand today? I see that you have a copy of my book in front of you. That's good. Thank you for buying a copy. Well, let me throw it back at you. What are, what are your hunches? What, what are you thinking? And then I'll, I'll build on what, what you think. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that the you, you, um, you just wanted to appear smart for a second and then disappear. No, um, I would say that probably the main through line that enables that would be obviously capitalism itself, um, and the ways in which, like, 
racialized hegemony um, like reproduces itself um, and just like the material conditions that have advanced um, without like seizing like the constant economic growth. But I'm also just wondering what culturally you think was the major through line that enabled that. All right, um, I'll try to get at your question and you let me know if I don't address it, right? I think a lot of it has to do with how we, or how many US historians, a high percentage, I would say, um, just don't even talk about empire, right? So those right-wing folks that I talked about, you know, um, they talked about empire for maybe four years, right? And so it was legible. Like I, I could actually talk to other people about the US empire and they didn't think I was crazy, right? But that was maybe what, 2005 to 2008, Obama got elected and then the US empire disappeared all over again, right? Even though the drone strikes continued. Um, and, and, and so I think it's about how we conceive of the US empire, how we begin to approach it. That's so critical, right? And I think part of it is, you know, this idea of continental expansion versus overseas expansion, as if they are completely um, separate processes, right? But if you just think about it for a minute, right? California in the 19th century could not have been more overseas, right? So, so these are constructs that we need to constantly deconstruct, right? Um, I'm not saying that all of these colonial processes are the same, that, that's not what I'm saying, but I do think they are related, right? And it's those, the, the relatedness um, that we should be trying to figure out. That, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions in the room? And if I can build on that, because it's my moment, right? I can do, say whatever. <laughs> you know, the, the the whole informal versus formal is such, it, it, it drives me crazy, right? Because somebody could write an entire book about the US empire. And really, if you read the book, it could not be more formal, right? But then at the end, they'll talk about how it's informal, right? It's just like, then what the hell is formal? What is informal? I mean, that is, that is the big question that we should be asking. So we have a question here, and then um, after this question, we'll take one from online. There's a couple in the queue. Um, thank you, this was great. Um, as you were talking about the discourses that kind of frame the kind of character figures that emerge, the seditious person, the criminal, the alien, et cetera, yep. you've hinted at a little bit how you were talking about, even in the organizing, folks coming here and going there are changing their thinking or reframing, et cetera. And you had mentioned too, it's part of how they're conceiving or how we are even conceiving, beginning the conversation with the US as an empire. I do it too with my students. But I was wondering if you might be able to comment on what you see. I work in the Caribbean and I think similarly about these things that are happening there with the US invasions. But I'm thinking about what is the epistemology that is undergirding the discourse and creating those. And then also the roles of the ontologies, the like the modes of being that are quite threatening. I think I'm thinking lately just about this relationship between what are those epistemologies and how to interrupt in those that are creating the discourses, I guess. But I was just wondering if you have thoughts. So are there particular, the particular parts of the Caribbean that you're looking at that, that sort of generating that question, if I can ask? I think in the Caribbean, there are just so many epistemologies, right? Yep. And more than that, too, different ways of being that are not, and thinking that are not just epistemological. So yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. But I'm curious <laughs> as to what you have to say about, yeah, in your case, what's, what might be the epistemological things that are undergirding that? Well, you know, I think there are different traditions of knowledge and practice that I'm trying to unpack, but also like there are a lot of, like the book became a lot more about the Philippines than I ever thought it would be. And I don't really consider myself a Philippine scholar. I don't pretend to be, although I write about the Philippines a lot in the book. Um, and, and it's there in part because of the archives I was looking at, right? And 
and, and so what was amazing to me was, okay, so I, I started looking at these archival records of the 1920 labor strike in Hawaii, right? And a lot of people have written about that strike. But what was amazing to me was that right next to those documents were uh, papers from the Philippines. Mm. And they are in the same archival collections, the same boxes, right? And that gave me an insight into how these, um, as Bulistan put it, those you know, bastards, the fascist bastards were thinking, mm -hmm. right? The colonial authorities are really thinking about these different spaces that, that I think get racialized and naturalized as foreign and domestic, but in really intricate ways that are connected, right? So even as they're talking about aliens and foreigners, they know that it's a construction, right? Mm -hmm. Even if they're not willing to admit it, mm -hmm. right? So these are processes at work. Another, uh, you know, fascinating um, lineage that I try, that I try to uh, trace, uh, at least to an extent, is, you know, the degree to which anarchism as a political movement informs anti-colonial thought, right? And it's, it's something that I think a lot of people tend to forget, I think, um, you know, before anti-communism, there was a global war on anarchism, right? Why? Well, it, it, not only the critique of the modern state, but it's the anti-colonial um, iterations of that particular movement that emerged at the 20th century that's so crucial, right? And, and so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question directly, but I would say there are all these different traces and movements, intellectual, um, political, ideological that we need to figure out, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and later in the book, the communist movement is critical, right? So there are all these people uh, congregating in Moscow, right? Um, and, 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 you know, there are quotes from people that went to Moscow talking about this, like, diversity, right? That, that, that would make, uh, you know, current modern universities in, in the U.S. jealous, right? They're talking about like this mix of humanity they could not imagine, right? Mm -hmm. Congregating in Moscow, um, not because of Stalin, right? But because really of Lenin and his insistence that it's colonialism that we should be talking about, right? So it's those different trajectories, lineages that I'm trying to figure out. So I see the hands in the room, but we're gonna just ask a question from online and then we'll come back. So um, this is a question from Steve uh, Lay, who's um, joined us today online. He says, uh, can you discuss the connection of capitalism to US empire and white supremacy? Yeah, buy the book. No. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I. I I think empire and racial capitalism and racial capitalism by talking about racial capitalism and talking about capitalism, right? Um, I think they are deeply entwined. Um, so in the book, I talk a lot about labor struggles because I think that really gets at the heart of anti-colonial struggles, right? So I talk about labor struggles, not only in Hawaii, but in the Philippines, in California. And I think it's the interracial solidarities that are being forged, right, through these anti-colonial movements that really threaten the racial capitalist order, right? So I would say in a nutshell, they are deeply entwined and you can't study one without the other. Thank you. So is your hand still? Yeah, oh, great. Oh, all right. Um, hi, how are you doing? Thank you. It was just fascinating. Uh, I think I'm going to follow up a little bit on Michael's question, Alan Michael's questions here, because it, it, uh, forgive me if I misunderstood you completely, but I think that um, is something that he just prompted me to think about is precisely about these forms of seditions that are not in this more formalized political arenas that you mentioned anarchism, communism, labor movement. Yeah. And so we're think, 
thinking of the Caribbean, you know, be walking around the street dressed in white with beads already says you are Santero, already tells us that you are a completely different thinking about cosmology, you are already a radical, seditious person. So that's the kind of thing I was wondering if you could speak about if, if it it doesn't have to be that you are dealing with it, but what came up in your materials that spoke to it or it didn't, you know, because then that can tell us a little bit also about how these imaginations of seditions are very different. And the Caribbean is about all about blackness, you know, and, 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 and what enslavement did and the kinds of inheritance about this particular, you know, colonial regime. So that's, that's one question. The other question, and I, I'll move very quickly, it's about, you know, the national security states that emerges. And I wonder, and this is just very, very uh, uh, selfish of me, uh, thinking about the drug trade, you know, as such an important element of, of you know, uh, intervention that emerges so early in the 20th century. Uh, and I was wondering if in your materials you have found these course related to or practices related to the drug trade as part of uh, feeding this sedition, this anxiety is about sedition too. So that's it. Andrew. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think I came across only one reference and that's not to say that it's not there. I wasn't looking for it. And there might be many collections that I, that, you know, that talk about it at length that I'm just not aware of. I mean, the thing about empires is they produce a lot of documents, right? To justify their colonial order and the US empire is no exception. So they're like that archive is huge, right? Um, the one reference was uh, to this Gadar uh, South Asian revolutionary who was stopping over in Hawaii. They wanted to check out his materials and his luggage, um, but they didn't have a legal justification for, for doing so. So the, the reason they gave was that they were like uh, checking for illegal drugs um, too. And then they end up taking his material and taking photos of all his documents and then and then releasing them. So that's that's an interesting question, but it's a dimension that I don't agree, that I didn't really come across. But again, it's not to say that's not there, right? Um, oh, uh, the idea of sedition going beyond formal radical politics. I think it's there. I think it, part of the reason why um, the U.S. colonial regime in in the Philippines, in particular. We're, it was so scared of the Stockholista movement. It was because it was part of a a a, a larger um, peasant based movement that was like the Communist Party was alive and well in the Philippines um, in the 1930s, but it never was really a popular movement, right? Whereas the Stockholista movement could claim to be more popular because I think it. Um, it tapped into uh, quasi-religious elements in the Philippines, um, much more so than, you know, reading uh, Capital, right? Yeah. So I think it's there. Um, was it legible to the U.S. security state? I mean, there's so many reports of, you know, these spiritual movements that, that the U.S. officials um, claim, define, interpret as seditious, right? They, they can't get a handle on them, right? And it's, they can't make sense of them. They know it's popular. They know it's keeping the anti-colonial movement alive, but they just don't get it. They can't understand it. And that's what's making them so anxious, right? Is that they don't understand the roots of it, right? And they just want to cast it off as, you know, backward and so forth, but they can't because it's so persistent, right? Now you open up another set of questions that ask the But then they also imagine, like they begin, the, and I'm talking about U.S. officials, they begin to imagine all these ties that are not quite there. Although I think, I think the, the anti-colonial uh, revolutionaries like kind of stoke those fears, but like, there are all these imagined connections between, you know, the peasant movement, Moscow, communism, but also Imperial Japan. And like Imperial Japan at the, at the time could not be more anti-radical. Um, 
but but they imagine all of these ties. Okay, we have another question online, and then we'll um, maybe take a final question from the audience. We have until 520, so we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, this one is submitted by our history department colleague, uh, Professor Vicente Rafael. Uh, he says, wonderful talk and terrific book. On the question of why Asian Americans would want to assimilate to the US, perhaps we might ask, what do they think they're assimilating to? Is the empire, is it the empire and its violent history or the nation with its promise of community and rights? Is it possible to think that it's precisely within the context of the latter that it becomes possible to critique the former? The response. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think uh, I can definitely see the, the political utility of framing things that way. But I don't know how you can disaggregate those two things uh, so neatly, because I don't think you can. Um, so what I would suggest is that if we want to, you know, proclaim, reclaim our Americanness, talk about citizenship rights and so forth, right? I'm not gonna stop you, I can't stop you, right? Um, that's fine, but what I would urge us to do is to deploy that kind of discourse, that kind of rhetoric, ironically, right? And 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 I don't know how you can do it, non-ironically, but I think that's that's what I would suggest. Right. Thank you. So um, there was a hand up here, um, but back here, so I will. Thank you. Um, great talk. I haven't read the book in its entire 300 page glory yet, but you know, I think I will. And I don't know if your question posed to the audience touches upon this in the book, or if this is just sort of like a soul searching question that you posed to us about why Asian Americans would even want to become a part of a state that has done so much violence to us and our peoples and peoples across the world. Um, and I guess my question is, how do you reconcile that that reality and that perception of the United States as just a great force of violence with the sort of immediate reaction from, I think, a very good number of Asian Americans saying like a knee jerk reaction, like we deserve to be here just as much as you do as a sort of challenge to the white supremacy of the United States without further upholding that white supremacy of the United States. I don't know if that made sense, but how do you reconcile that, especially with activists that saw the political utility in claiming the United States as a space, especially for organizing outside of maybe their home countries? Yeah, no, thank you, Sarah. And I think that builds on Vince's question. And um, I mean, it, it's a complicated question in that I think what you're gesturing toward, and I think Vince uh, refers to it as well, is like so many people feel it, they want to believe it, and therefore should we not contend with it somehow, right? Um, to, in a sense, become politically legible, because otherwise we will be cast as, you know, disloyal, seditious, alien, and so forth. Now, I'm not suggesting that we embrace the seditious label, um, because I think that then we will become targets of violence, of racial violence. So that's not what I'm suggesting. But at the same time, I think we need to, like, if you're going to invoke that, that language, right, of citizenship, citizenship rights, deserving of recognition, of protection, right? Um, I just think we need to be critical and careful as we deploy that rhetoric, right? To realize that that is a strategy, right? But not to really believe in it, because how can you, right? Really, like, um, and, you know, uh, so, Toward the end of the book, I write about Carl Yoneda, right? 
you know this, right? Um, he, he's a communist, he organizes with Filipino workers, he's being uh, monitored by the FBI. Um, but then during World War II, because he's such a diehard anti-fascist, he, like, he becomes the super patriot, like super American. Um, pledges loyalty to the United States, talks about, you know, incarcerating uh, pro-Japanese, Japanese Americans, even before Executive Order 9066, um, even as the FBI continues to monitor his activities as a, you know, a dangerous red, as the FBI files um, called Yoneda, um, he begins to um, he becomes an informant for the FBI in America's concentration camps, right? And so, yeah, he deployed that, that rhetoric of being loyal to the United States, but what did that get Yoneda? Um, not much. In fact, it landed him and fellow Japanese Americans in a concentration camp, right? So, at least in, in, you know, I understand the political um, utility of that discourse. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I, I live in the real world, okay? I get it, right? And I get that a lot of Asian Americans wanna believe in that project, okay? Um, but as historians, as scholars, as critical thinkers, that doesn't mean we need to support that discourse we can suggest something otherwise, right? I mean, there has to be something better than racial capitalism and liberal democracy, right? Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> okay, well, we have a um, few remaining minutes and there is one remaining question online if we wanna, if we wanna get to that. Uh, this is from um, Professor at Uni University of Washington Bothell, uh, Dan Berger. He says, thanks for this excellent talk and exciting book. How do you see the, quote, U.S. security state, unquote, that forms against these anti-colonial solidarities across the Pacific in connection with the U.S. carceral state as a concept and formulation, especially with regard to Black, Indigenous, and labor solidarities within and beyond the U.S.? Yeah, no, I think um, it's definitely a part of it. Uh, I, I think the whole, whole um, immigration system is reliant not only on repatriation, deportation, but it's also about incarceration, right? And so the, the logic of the US liberal state that I trace in the book or that I try to trace in the book, I think, leads to what I just mentioned to the to the um, mass incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, you know, in certain parts of the book, I do talk about Black Asian solidarities and um, I forget the chapter number, but I do talk about that, right, Lynn, you can vouch for that. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's, and, you know, Imperial Japan figures prominently not only among you know Asian anti-colonial um, revolutionaries, but lots of black folks, black intellectuals look to Imperial Japan um, in, in the first two decades of the 20th century. I mean, right after the Russo-Japanese War, people like W.B. Du Bois were celebrating you know, Japan for defeating uh, Russia. So I think there are these moments of interracial solidarities that are that are possible um, and, and the US security state. And I'm talking about not even the FBI, but the forerunner to the FBI, the Bureau of Investigation. They begin monitoring people from the Caribbean, black people from the Caribbean, black radical thinkers. And part of it is that they are forming these interracial solidarities and they wanna contain them as much as possible, repress them. And I think, um, the criminalization of radical thought, anti-colonial thought affected not only Asians, but definitely black people as well, right? And definitely um, fed into the rise of the carceral state.
Well, um, Amy, did you have a closing closing question? Congratulations, Moon. What a great project. Uh, I was hoping for a bonus content. So given the news out of the Philippines today about the resuscitation oh, of the please. Marcos regime, could you just riff on that a bit? No, I think Vince should. Um, as I said, I'm not a Philippine scholar. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around that. Um, but I do think not that the U.S. empire is the center of the universe, but I think there are weird ways that it does touch on, definitely touch on, goes back to the U.S. empire, definitely um, in some ways, but I'm trying to figure out what those connections are. Well, with that, uh, thank you all so much for joining us uh, this uh, this evening. If you know someone who wanted to attend but could not, we'll be putting a recording up online um, and sending out uh, a link to all who registered online. Um, thank you so much for uh, sharing your book with us today. Thank you for the comments, Rest and Wen. And um, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us and, and sticking with the live stream through the troubles. Thank you. <laughs>